Welcome to 4RG Meets. My name is Scott McKinley and I am your host for the evening. I'm so grateful to see all your faces here today because uh, uh, it demonstrates that you're, you've got a commitment to, to helping out in this uh, time of a, of a climate crisis and that's always a great thing to see. So 4RG Meets is a creation of For Our Grandchildren, which is a nonprofit climate action group based in uh, Nogojiwanan, Peterborough, and it uh, is run completely by volunteers. Uh, we aim to engage and mobilize people to take effective action in response to the climate crisis. Uh, if you would like to be uh, more active in our community, you can uh, always uh, go to our webpage at forourgrandchildren.ca and become um, part of one of our communities by, uh, by officially joining us and then uh, work on anything from public rallies and political lobbying to community outreach outreach or uh, administration and social media for that matter. We also have a digital newsletter, uh, a public Facebook group, a private Facebook group, and an Instagram account. As I said, we're all volunteers and uh, there is no fee for joining 4RG, um, but uh, we do re rely entirely on donations. So if you're so inclined, there is a, a link there for that as well. And now to the main event for the evening. Hailing all the way from Nogojiwanong, uh, Robert Lockhart has returned to 4RG Meets for round two of electric vehicle technology. So I know for myself over the past five years or so, the number of uh, EVs that I've seen on the road, not, not just in Vancouver, but right here in Peterborough, has grown exponentially. And over those same five years or so, Rob has developed a passion for EVs and electric transportation, fueled by his son David's desire to get an EV at a time when there were only a handful of choices. So uh, then the decision was made in the Lockhart family to go all in on the electrics in 2021. And at that point, um, there, there needed to be a lot more information. And so Rob dug in and Sue became an expert in the subject. Uh, when Rob's not thinking about EVs, he continues his nearly 50 year profession as a parks and recreation planner. And Rob and his uh, partner Donna also have a long standing passion for boating and their Peter Robinson era log home. And so please welcome everyone, Robert Lockford. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Scott. And before I flip over to my uh, to my to my PowerPoint, I just want to uh, uh, to, to mention that uh, quite a bit of what I'm going to talk about tonight is is going to be really a lot a lot that's been mentioned so far as a segue into it in terms of you know what can we do as individuals and um, you know so, some of the impacts of, of of some of the decisions we make and and how collectively uh, many grains of sand can make a beach. So. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to just uh, bring my my screen up right now. And um, okay, great. All right. So um, as Scott has mentioned, this is uh, part two. It was two years ago that I that I did this last. And um, the things that we're going to talk about are similar, but not quite exactly the same as last time. I'm going to talk about um, the, uh, the 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 impact of of, of transportation uh, on our on our uh, on, on our environment. I want to talk about um, sort of what's happening with EV adoption and the fact that we've got a long way to go. Quite a bit on the basics of electric vehicles for those of you who don't know a lot about them. Um, what it's like, what the charging situation is like, what the industry is up to, and there's where the biggest change has happened in the last two years. The lingering barriers to EV adoption, and, and that is diminishing quite rapidly. And the fact that there is some some momentum that's beginning to to gain, and uh, therefore there's going to be hope. So I want to begin with the fact that um, you know transportation accounts for about twenty five percent of the greenhouse gas emissions in in Canada and for in the U S as well. And about half of that can be attributed to um, to light duty vehicles, et cetera. And uh, you know transportation has a very high impact uh, in, in urban areas in particular. But there are three elements at play here, and and one of them is that that uh, you know governments have a role to play in terms of policy that they can strike to to encourage things to move forward, whether that be legislation or or things like grants. Um, the auto industry has to play their part because without producing the vehicles, there will be nothing to to buy or lease. And then individuals and companies have to make their decision 
to actually jump into the pond and, and get an electric vehicle or a fleet of vehicles. So you can see here that it's a three-way game and, and that without one part playing a role, a major role, it's not gonna happen. And so that's where part of one element of that three-way uh, play is, is us, all of us as individuals and the decisions that we can make um, uh, toward uh, making a decision about an electric vehicle. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've, we've come a ways, but there's still a long way to go to, to move from where, where we were a few years ago to where we need to be down the road. And in North America, um, EVs represent a very small percentage of the vehicles on the road, uh, you know, any, anywhere from under 1% in, many, in some jurisdictions to over 40% in California. In Canada, we're somewhere between 1% and 2% of all the vehicles on the road, you know, close to half a million. Um, which, by the way, is the number of EV sales that there were in the U.S. last year for the entire country, um, but varies by province a lot, with B.C. and Quebec leading the way. Um, in 2022, EV sales were about 133,000 units, and, and that's up this year, although we don't have a full number yet for, for the year. Um, annual sales worldwide in 2022 were about 10.5 million, and that's up 55% over 2020. And by 2025, we figure the number of EVs in the road are going to be going to be around 55 million. That's on the road, not just sold. And 145 million by 2030, which is only six years from now. So you can see what's beginning to happen here. We're starting to move up the, the hockey stick where you start off slowly, you hit the tipping point, and then things take off. So just a couple of things about what's going on in Canada right now. So as of last quarter, the end of June, um, 10.1% 10, 10 of all light duty vehicles in Canada that were sold were, were, were electric vehicles, 35,000 of them. That's up from 8% uh, this time last year. And if you go back to 2019, it's up from 3%. So you can see we've already more than tripled uh, the number of, of EV sales per, per year between 2019 and now. British Columbia is leading the way at just over 20%. Quebec is at 18 and climbing rapidly. It'll soon take over BC. Ontario's lagging way behind at 7%. In fact, the last quarter, um, Ontario dropped below where they were six months ago. Um, so they're not pulling their weight, even though they are by numbers, because so many people live in Ontario. Because there are no provincial incentives here, rebates, uh, the percentage of people buying electric vehicles is way below what it is in other parts of Canada. Adoption is highest in big cities like Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Victoria. In Vancouver last year, about 25% of all um, vehicles sold were electric. Um, so two and a half times the national average. A big drop off uh, in adoption in rural and smaller communities where people are a little more nervous about how far they are from the clear, nearest charging station. And we look at the biggest motivators. We're seeing things like rebates obviously are play a big role. The high cost of fuel is a driver. The ability to easily charge your vehicle, which is a one of the things that people worry about. And um, the person's desire to go green, which isn't what everyone thinks about. Most people choose to go electric to save money rather than to go green, but you can, you can do both. So just a couple of fun facts here. So the very first automobiles in, in North America were actually electric going back into the mid 1800s. And, they dominated the auto industry until the early 1900s. Um, around um, 1900, the, the horse was definitely king, pulling uh, either a buggy or, or riding on top. But by around 2015, just 15 years later, mass-produced gasoline-powered vehicles had taken over, thanks to, to the discovery of oil and, of course, Henry Ford's assembly line. So that's when it all started to go downhill. CO2 emissions uh, were beginning to rise as the Industrial Re Revolution began to take hold, and the automobile was right smack in the middle of it. Now, here are a couple of interesting photos. So on the left, this is uh, Fifth Avenue in New York. Um, in the year 1900, there is one um, automobile right in the middle of the photograph, circled in red. 13 years later, there is one horse. You can't even see it, but there's one horse in this photograph somewhere. So between 1900 and 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 uh, 1913, just 13 years later, we went from a horse-dominated transportation system to a internal combustion engine-dominated transportation system. There are many who believe that we'll see the same thing happen with electric vehicles, and maybe even that quickly. We'll see. We're we're getting close to that tipping point. 
So just a couple things about electric vehicles that people, there's a lot of confusion out there between what people, we started off with the hybrid vehicle, the, the white one up in, in the top right hand corner, that was our first electric vehicle or electrified vehicle. It was a, it was a hybrid, um, not a plug in at all. It, it didn't run on pure electricity, it didn't go anywhere on its own, except the gas, that gas engine still worked. And the electric motor just helped the gas motor to become more efficient, but it really wasn't an electric vehicle. Picture in the, the, the below it, the red picture is, is, is another Prius, and, and that is one you plug in, and it was our second vehicle. And you plugged it in, and you could drive a certain distance, anywhere from 30 to 70 kilometers, and, and that's going up uh, with new vehicles that are coming on the road. But at the end of the day, um, once you ran out of battery power or running on pure electric, it switched over to gas electric, and uh, then you're back to being similar to a, a, a hybrid. The bottom picture is 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 our latest vehicle, um, and it is pure electric. Um, and, and of course, we'll go as far as the battery will take it until you need to plug in again. So a lot of people do what we did, and they made the the, the baby steps. They 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 started off with, with the hybrid. They went to the plug-in hybrid, and then they were ready to go all electric. We really recommend people jump right into it because uh, things are not nearly as as dicey as they were two years ago or five years ago. So the scariness is, is rapidly disappearing. So EVs include every kind of vehicle you can imagine, everything from sedans and SUVs to crossovers, minivans, trucks of all types and sizes, including heavy duty trucks like dump trucks and garbage trucks and fire trucks, buses and motorcycles. They're, they're all electrified now uh, to varying degrees. Uh, trains and watercraft and, and aircraft, snowmobiles, Bicycles and scooters and farm equipment are also being electrified right down to your garden tractor. Um, at the moment, there are around 150 plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles in Ontario. People are surprised about that. Um, 300, 400 more models are, are, are on the drawing board or about to be announced over the next couple of years. So we're going to see quite an increase in the number of models that are going to be available to us. Um, EVs are improving rapidly, um, range is improving, uh, charging time is, is, is getting faster, the price is starting to come down a little very slowly, uh, and a lot of advances in technology. And the trend is from the small, eccentrically styled sedans and, and, and SUVs like the, the Prius Prime, the Chevy Bolt, the Hyundai Kona, to large utilitarian vehicles like the Ford F-150 Lightning pickup truck, and the Kia EV9, which is actually a three-row um, SUV that I think will hold seven people. So um, it, it, we're, we're certainly moving in a direction toward mainstream when it comes to the kinds of vehicles that are becoming available to us all. Now, Canadians travel on average, according to Natural Resources Canada, about 41 kilometers a day. So that's well within the range of most plug-in hybrids and certainly every electric vehicle on the road. Fully electric vehicles have a range of anywhere from 160 to 1,000 kilometers, but most of them are in that 350 to 450 range uh, as calculated by Transport Canada. Anticipated future range is upwards of 1,500 kilometers, maybe even higher. Um, a recent GM survey uh, in the U.S. said that most people were comfortable with 300 miles or 475 kilometers of range. Well, with pretty well every electric vehicle that's available now, you've got that range. Um, what we need to explain is, and this is something that a lot of people don't understand as well, is that just because your Transport Canada says you can go 500 kilometers doesn't mean you can. That only about 75% of that's really available to you. And there's many reasons for that, but the most important one is that you don't really use all of your battery. You seldom completely fill it up because you don't like to charge over 80% very often. It takes too long and it's not good for the battery except for some of the new ones. But you also don't want it to drop down much below 15% unless you know for sure where your next charging station is going to be. So you really run within that 20 to, to 75 um, uh, range part of your battery, which really means you only got about 60% or even less available to you. And 15 to 30% less in winter, depending on the vehicle, because cold weather has an impact on the range of the battery. So some vehicles are better than others, depending on their battery management system. Um, but um, it is uh, something to keep in mind that, that, that you will um, sit for a little bit of range uh, loss in the wintertime. So batteries are the key ingredient, and um, they are um, they're slowly becoming less expensive. 
uh, I underlined the word slowly. Uh, they're, they're, they're going to become lighter. They're going to become quicker to charge. They're going to be uh, producing more range per, per kilometer of, of, of weight, and they're going to last a lot longer. Um, new batteries under development include uh, solid state, uh, solid state hydrogen, and various combination of iron, sulfur, sodium, aluminum, phosphate, and lithium. And uh, some are going to have a projected life of 4 million kilometers of driving and up to 40 years of use. And the, one of those batteries is currently available in some of the new Teslas. You can, in fact, get, they, they come equipped with a battery that will do 4 million kilometers and, and it'll last 40 years. It was just announced uh, about a month or so ago by Toyota that they're going to jump straight to solid state batteries from, they're not even going to go to use, go to lithium ion route. They're going to jump right over that. And that their batteries are going to have a life of something like that as well. Now, that could be five to seven years away because they haven't produced the battery yet. So we'll see. But that's one of their policy decisions they've just made. But one of the neat things about all of these batteries, and particularly lithium batteries, is that they can have a second life. Once you've reached the point in your car where you maybe you've lost 20 or 30 percent of the range or your car's worn out, the battery can be taken out of the vehicle and used as wall storage where you really don't care how, 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 how much range you've got in it. It's how much capacity you've got. So for half the price of a new battery, you can get wall storage that, that's maybe got 70 percent of, 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 of its usefulness in it but it'll replace the generator that you might have needed uh, in your home to, to deal with issues around, uh, around uh, a power outage. And the lithium batteries are about 95% recyclable over and over and over again. So, um, and some of the processes still produce greenhouse gas emissions, but they're now working on processes that are very, very light in that department. So that's good news as well. Eventually we'll have mined enough of the raw materials we need. Once we have half, uh, uh, half the batteries, uh, half of them can be recycled. We can keep reusing that that product in new batteries uh, all the time we're making the particular type. So the impact on mining may not be quite as severe as we think it is at this point in time. Now, the game changer, in, in my mind, is going to be the cost. That EVs will soon be similar to or lower than the cost of a gasoline or diesel-powered vehicle. Um, battery prices are dropping. Uh, 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent less labor is needed to build an electric vehicle. And economies of scale will lower the cost. And I think competition will be the biggest factor. I mean, so many vehicles right now are playing off of, of, of the Tesla vehicles. And if they drop their price, then Ford will drop their price and so on down the line. So we're going to see competition playing a big part because to a great extent, the cost of electric vehicles is artificial. Um, only the companies that only make electric vehicles have to worry about what it costs to make their vehicle. Um, the bigger companies that only make maybe 1% of their vehicles are electric have all the gas vehicles to, to, to take the profit from, and they can decide what they want to sell their electric vehicle for. So that's where the competition is going to kick in. In Canada, EVs cost um, two to 4000 less per year to fuel and have uh, much lower maintenance and repair costs. Um, uh, CAA thinks it's going to be in the order of 50%, but we won't know for another five years till we have enough on the road and enough length to see what's going to happen. But what we found is that if you can charge at home, um, that your cost of running your electric vehicle is only two to three cents a kilometer. Now, that's amazing when you think about it. If you live in a city, uh, we live in the country, so our costs are higher. If you live in Peterborough, and if you're able to charge an off-peak powers, you might get that down to one cent per, per, per kilometer. You just think about that. Uh, compare that to the cost of your of a gas-powered vehicle. And you add to that the fact that your maintenance costs are nearly zero. So in our experience, we've had our, our vehicle for uh, just over two years. We've driven almost 50,000 kilometers. All we've done is rotate the wheels three times. That's it. That's our total cost plus electricity to, to charge the vehicle. And so our costs are way below three to four thousand dollars less for us uh, it, to 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 have our electric vehicle compared to a comparable uh, gas vehicle. This is another point of comparison. We we have a a gas Miata uh, a Mazda Miata mm -hmm. that uh, requires premium fuel. It costs more to fill that vehicle up once than it does to charge our electric car for an entire month. Um, we're averaging somewhere between. 40 and $50 a month 
um, to run our vehicle if we're just charging at home. If we have to charge on the highway, it's about three times as much as that, but still a lot less than gasoline. So lower priced EVs cost uh, 25 to 30% less uh, to purchase and fuel and maintain over eight years and, and, and 160,000 kilometers than a comparable gas vehicle. Mm -hmm. This research was done by uh, Clean Energy Canada last year, and I think they've updated it, but I haven't seen their latest report. So they took um, about a dozen different types of electric vehicles from small ones to right up to, to the F Ford F-150 pickup truck. And they looked at everything that was involved from mining the materials right through to recycling the vehicle at the end of its life. And they found out that in every case, the electric vehicle costs less to own and operate over eight years than the gas vehicle. And in some cases, it was thousands of dollars less per, per year over, over the eight year period, like twenty five to thirty thousand dollars less for the electric vehicle than the, the gas vehicle. So that's something to keep in mind as well. It's not just the purchase price. It's the overall all in cost of, of owning, uh, purchasing and, and operating and maintaining the vehicle over the lifetime of it. So EVs appear to be very durable. And, and and they should require much less maintenance. They have 99.9% .9 pure moving parts. Electric motors are expected to last a half million miles, kilometers or more, probably a lot more, but we don't know for sure yet. Uh, and I talked about the batteries, um, you know, pushing out to at the currently 400,000 kilometers, but the new batteries are going to be two to four million and going from 12 to 15 years to 25 to 40 years. So that's something to keep in mind that the last thing we worry about is the life of our battery um, or losing range. We might have lost 1% or 2%. We don't even notice it. Now, for many people, charging an electric vehicle is what they worry most about. Um, it, it, it's, it, you know, but in reality, most of your charging, if you're able to, is going to be done at home or at work. If you happen to have a workplace where you can plug in. It's like having a gas station at your home or workplace. You always leave with the full tank. Um, however, one of the big problems we have here is that about a third of Canadians live in apartment buildings of some kind or other, where either it's a condo or it's a rental, and the building was not constructed with EV charging in mind, and for a whole variety of reasons, either, you know, the reluctance by the owner, the fact that it's technically challenging, they're not able to charge their vehicle at home, and that is a problem for a lot of people and it's stopping them from making the switch to electric. So the good news is that there's now technology available by at least one Canadian company and, and maybe more to find ways to take any apartment building um, and without changing the electrical supply of the building, finding a way to be able to charge electric vehicles without it impacting on the building. And you know, you can ask me later for more details on that, but it, it, it's possible in about 90% of the cases so making um, what they call MERBs, which are multi-unit residential buildings, EV ready, um, this has become a much higher priority of government through regulations, uh, financial support may be needed, and it, there may have to be some sort of mandate put in place. And in some cities, it, it already is a requirement that you have to, if you're putting up a new apartment building or building a parking garage, you have to make it EV ready for charging. Um, and Ontario, isn't one of those provinces that are doing that, although the city of Toronto is. Um, and we're finding out from the research that we've been doing that any community can do that um, if they want to set the policies in place to make it happen. And that's something else that we might talk about later if, if there's a question on it. Now, charging electric vehicles, you know, pub the public charging infrastructure is equally as important as, as what you have at home. Even though we will go for months at a time with ever needing public charging. But the very moment we drive, want to drive beyond our range, we're going to have to find a place to charge. Now, the pictures you're seeing here up in the top left-hand corner is our setup at home. And uh, over in the far left, you're seeing our, our plug that we plug our cord into that plugs into our car. And in the bottom corner, you see a, a, a bag full of different kinds of, of plugs that we can use to plug into a, a campground or or our home or, or 120 or it's some other kind of connector. And the, the bottom picture shows a vehicle plugged in uh, in someone's garage or just outside of it. But on the highway, um, you need to have fast chargers that are direct current as opposed to at home where it's alternating current. 
and they're going to be much faster. There are over 20,000 charge points uh, or cables uh, in, in Canada right now, but only about 10% uh, of them are fast chargers. And they range from 50 to 400 kilowatts, and, and that really determines the speed at which your, your vehicle can charge, along with the vehicle itself. Some vehicles can't charge faster than a certain amount, so no matter what they plug into, they're going to be slow, and others are faster. There are three different kinds of, of, of chargers out there. There's the combined charging system, or CCS, for everyone who's not a Tesla. Um, they're not as robust. There aren't as many of them. Um, they're not as reliable, but they're out there. Then Chatamo is the original charging network that was put in place for the Nissan LEAF, but it's being discontinued because the LEAF is being discontinued. And then there's the Tesla supercharger network. And uh, Tesla announced just the other day that they've just opened their, I think it's 50,000th charging station in the world. Um, there are, I well, think about 4,000 in North America and it's doubling pretty well every year. Now, the good news is, is that the transition is underway in this area. Um, about a year ago, Tesla gave away to the world their, the patent on their charge cord. Their plug, and the and the chart and and the and of course the whole technology for how to, how their system works, and it took about a year. But Ford was the first company to take them up on it. About a month later, General Motors decided they were going to make the switch, and that was the tipping point. As soon as they, as soon as General Motors said they were in, a whole bunch of other car companies followed suit. They're not all in yet, but but over half of all the major car companies in the world have made the decision to switch over. So for North America. Um, eventually, and probably within about five years, that the, the, the Tesla system, what's going to be called the North American Charging Standard, is going to be the plug of choice, and that all or most vehicles will be able to plug into that network. Um, and maybe even some will be able to use the CCS system as long as it lasts. But that's a good thing that we're starting to see some, some winners here in terms of which way it's going to go. It didn't matter which way it went as long as it went one way or another. In Europe, it's the CCS system that won out. Now, beyond what you have at, at on the highway, the, the, the fast chargers, there's also level two chargers. Um, and they, they operate on, on alternating current. They're much slower. And there are many vendors involved in that business. And then there's hydrogen. And at last count, there were only five locations in Canada. And I think they're all around Vancouver. So hydrogen has got a long way to go before it becomes um, something that, that we need to be thinking about as an alternative to battery electric. Hmm. So over the next year, next decade, um, billions of dollars are going to be required to build out our national charging network. Um, and government's going to be involved. The commercial sector is going to be involved. Natural Resources Canada thinks we're going to need one charge point for every 20 EVs. Currently, we're at about half that. And with the number of EVs coming on board, we're going to have to roll out the, uh, the, the, um, the, the charging system at four times the rate. Uh, and most new charges need to be the fast chargers that you have on the highway. So the fastest chargers can provide up to 320 kilometers of range in 10 minutes. But most EVs can't charge that fast yet, typically taking from 20 to 60 minutes to charge from 20 to 80 percent. But when we're traveling on a long trip, we charge from between 15 and 60 percent, which gives us about two, two and a half hours of driving and lets us recharge in 15 minutes, which is about the length of time it takes to have a pit break and maybe get a, get a cold drink or a cup of coffee and get on the road again. So we don't lose any time when we're doing our long trips now that we figured out how to do it. Um, now charging speed, um, the number of charge points per location, reliability and ease varies by type of charger. And the, the supercharging network by Tesla is by far the best right now. And as I said, it's going to be good to see the transition over to that by most automakers. And this problem we're worrying about right now is going to go away. Um, right now, if you were to buy an electric vehicle tomorrow, I can tell you that in pretty well all of North America, you're not going to have any problem whatsoever charging your vehicle. You might in some very remote parts of Canada um, uh, where there just isn't a lot of, 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 uh, a lot of chargers yet. But for, for most of us, it's not a problem. All the major highways, even Highway 7 and highways of that sort of second level below the 400 series highways are fully electrified. Um, you know, every 
you know, a couple hundred kilometers. So Tesla, Petro Canada, Volkswagen, Ivy, and many other companies are all involved in it. Um, and the fact that given that most EVs are charged at home and off peak hours, the electric supply companies really like EVs and they're doing everything they can to encourage us to, 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 to get an EV and to charge it at home because it evens out to draw on the system. If because at nighttime, the system isn't used very much. And if a lot of electric vehicles are charging at night, it's going to uh, increase the, the use of the system, which is already in place. So the electric um, uh, supply companies are going to make more money per hour if more people are charging or are, are using electricity. Now, a lot of people ask the question, where is the power going to come from? And there's no doubt that we're going to need a lot more. And it's going to cost a lot of money to, to make it happen. Um, but um, it is starting to happen. We're hearing Ontario are laying out plans for increasing the, the, uh, the power generation, um, partly through nuclear, partly through, through renewable, and unfortunately, partly through natural gas. We hope that one doesn't catch on. But at the moment, it's the quickest one to get in place. And we may have to see it for a while, but hopefully it won't last forever. You know, it, we will get there. And, and as demand slowly increases, so will the power supply. And if, if Norway can do it, Canada can do it. That's kind of the way I look at it. Now, the other neat thing that, that we now have is the ability of your electric vehicle, many of them, not all of them yet, but many of them, to do a reverse where from your battery, you can charge your home, you can provide power to your house, or you can put power back into the grid. So imagine if you had a million electric vehicles plugged in at home and you had a power outage. If you could flip a switch and take the power from those million electric vehicles, you could run Ontario for quite a few hours, if not quite a few days, depending on how many vehicles were plugged in and what the overall capacity is. And as more and more electric vehicles were plugged in, uh, more, there's, there's more and more capacity at the giant battery to be able to power um, the province. Right now, it, it, we're hearing that it, it, the average house needs about 15 kilowatts, uses about 15 kilowatts of power a day if you, you really dampen down what your requirements are. So if you have a generator, you're, you're not going to have all the circuits operating in that generator. You're, you're only going to have a few of them. So if you had used the same principle with, 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 a, with either wall storage or your electric car, and you had a vehicle with 150 kilowatt, uh, kilowatts of, of battery power in it, like the Ford pickup truck, you could run your day, your, your, your house for 10 days if you had a power outage. If you had a regular car, you could run your house for about four or five days, which is well beyond the range of most power outages, at least so far. So this is a technology that could save our bacon in terms of having, instead of having to have huge batteries all over Ontario, we could simply or partially depend on electric vehicles as, as millions of batteries plugged into the grid, being able to help us in at times of need, either in peak times or during power outages. So this is a big deal. And, and we're gonna see more electric vehicles going this way as we head into the, into the future. So the auto industry is, is really increasing its commitment to EVs. This is the biggest change over the last two years. With tri stricter government quotas and incentives and investments, as well as increasing demand from consumers, trillions of dollars, not just millions now, it's trillions are being committed by the automakers worldwide for EV adoption. Um, GM is building EV trucks in Ingersoll. Ford is going to, be, I think their entire plant in Oakville is going to be turned over to electric vehicles. GM, Solantis, Volkswagen, and, and a company in Quebec just last week announced, uh, um, you know, bat battery plants. Kingston uh, has secured a cathode plant. Um, Quebec's Lion Electric Bus Company is going to assemble batteries. And there's a lot of rumors about Tesla soon going to make a big announcement for Ontario or Quebec uh, for something. And we don't know what it's going to be yet, but it could be an assembly plant or a battery plant or something or other, but uh, we'll know soon enough. Um, all major automakers are moving toward electrification of their fleets. Some of them are way out in front of others. The Japanese are, are, are not. They're slow to the game. Um, they figure they're a decade behind. They've been pretty focused on hydrogen because Japan relies on hydrogen more than they do battery electric. Our federal government has targeted 2035 as the year to fully phase out the sale of new light-duty um, uh, ICE vehicles or internal combustion engine vehicles. 
20% by 2026 and 60% by 2030. We're already at 10. So I can't imagine we're going to have any trouble meeting 20% by 2026. So, and that's going to be significantly backed by financial penalties if you don't make it. And the U.S. government followed our suit and put in place the same guidelines, although they're not officially mandated like they are in Canada. Um, the, the companies that have fleets are probably going to lead the way. Um, for economic reasons, for the most part, um, they're going to be the, the quickest adopters. One decision can make the difference up for thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of vehicles, where we make one decision for one vehicle at a time. So Amazon orders 100,000 Rivian delivery trucks. FedEx orders 500 delivery vans from GM. Pure later orders 3,500 delivery vans from GM and Ford, and on it goes. Even the, the companies that are renting vehicles like Hertz are ordering electric vehicles and putting them out there. Canada Post has just started it, it, its first 14 electric vehicles in Nanaimo, BC. They've got a fleet of 14,000, so they've got a long way to go, but they've started. So the commercial sector understands the economic advantages of EVs before the individual and even governments do. Um, so they're looking at, uh, they're not looking at the higher purchase price, they're looking at the, the, the return on investment, which they are seeing as five to 10 years in the electric vehicle lasting a lot longer than their diesel vehicle. So they're seeing the economy of it and we should as, as individuals as well. Um, last time, I don't think there were any pickup trucks. So there might've been, the Ford might've been about ready to be introduced. Now there are 11 different um, uh, uh, pickup trucks that I could find. They're not all readily available right now, but they're, they're all out there. And there will be, you'll be able to take possession soon. And that's the list that I was able to find and the range of, of kilometers everywhere from 800 kilometers down to sort of in the, in the 320 range. Toyota hasn't announced what their range is yet on their Tacoma, which they just announced uh, about a month ago. So, but there are lots of trucks and SUVs, which we're now starting to see. So the last bit I want to talk about is some of the lingering barriers to adoption. I want to really emphasize the lingering part because uh, a lot of this is becoming old news, but for many people, it's still top of mind because it, it's what they think they know. So lack of knowledge and fear of the unknown is one. Um, high purchase price is still a big deal for a lot of people, even though the cost of operation is lower. Perceived range anxiety, which is quickly disappearing. And once you own an EV, uh, that disappears within a week, if maybe to a month. It, it's gone very, very quickly. The biggest problem is insufficient supply. Choice is, is not is starting to, to solve itself, but, but the insufficient supply is a big deal. With many people waiting, you know, one, two, three years for electric, for electric vehicle. Drew Monkman can certainly attest to that. Um, inadequate charging infrastructure, both home and public, is still a problem for some, uh, and that will hopefully improve. But but those are some of the barriers that are out there. Now, experts predict that EV adoption will take off in North America in the next two to three years, and, and I, I think so as well. I think we're close to the tipping point. Improving charging network, increasing choice and supply, or purchase price, and increasing awareness of the positive aspects of EV ownership. Um, so I think we're closer to the tipping point than you might think. For new technologies like smartphones and computers, et cetera, when you reach about 5% adoption, that's when it takes off. Uh, you go from a very slow climb up to exponential increases up to you get to about 80 to 90%, and then it levels off. So we're at 10% now, but 2% of the, of the vehicles on the road being electric, 10% um, of sales and 2% of, of vehicles on the road. So we're getting there. We need to be at 5%. And I think we'll be there by 2025. Um, Standard & Poor's predicts the same thing. EV sales at 13% by the end of this year, 17% by the end of 2024. About 60% of Canadians say they're likely to buy an EV for the next vehicle, with about 30% saying they're certain. 60% um, of Canadians already think that a lifetime cost of owning an EV is going to be lower. And about 72% of Canadians think that EVs will become the majority um, of, of, of vehicles that, that are going to be on the road. So that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, I wanted to leave you with a couple of images. This one is 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 a is a mock-up of, of what an electric vehicle charging station on the 401 might look like in a few years. 
compared to what we have today, and for those of you who own EVs, you know what I'm talking about, we've got a long way to go. We got to up our game a lot to get to this point. But, it, you know, it, 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 it's certainly possible. And there's a company operating out of BC that is going to build the first one of these uh, in British Columbia near Vancouver uh, in the near future. And uh, we're going to see more of them as, um, as the marketplace dictates. So I'm going to end with one last slide here and open it up for questions. Um, leave this one up, and um, I'm finished my presentation. Thank you. Scott, you can take over. Well, that was a lot of information, <laughs> somewhat overwhelming. Now, um, people should know Robert mentioned to me earlier that he has a document that contains a great deal of the information that he provided here. Uh, he sent it to me. I am going to make sure it's available on the web page and a link to it uh, when I get the uh, video for this uh, presentation put on the uh, put on the website as well. Um, now I've asked Guy to uh, offer a, a proper word of thanks this evening, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Guy here to to summarize and and say thanks again. Uh, so thanks, Rob. That's that's really amazing. And I just remarked as we were watching this the difference between the presentation from two years ago and today. And it is amazing. And it's all going in a direction that really feels very positive. Thank, thanks for highlighting that and doing all the research that you do. I know you love doing research and you've done it all here. And I, I, I can't imagine that you'll be able to still keep up with the changes that are happening. They're coming, they're coming so quickly now, but all of them are really positive. And uh, you're, I have to say, you're lucky to have a Tesla because I'm still not just lingering doubts about uh, charging capabilities on the road. I still have real ones. I've showed up in places where there've been other people plugged in or the charging station has been broken. You don't have that problem with Tesla, but I know my problem's going to be cured next year too. So it's really great. Anyway, Rob, thanks. Thanks very much for this. And I'm sure that other people like me have lots of questions. Yeah. So let's open up those questions. And uh, so uh, Richard, what's your question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. So my question was about the recycling the battery. Uh, Robert, you said that uh, the batteries can be recycled in some way. So presumably once the vehicle has ended its life, what do you do? Like, does does somebody take the battery out and recharge it or something? No, the the the, the battery is if if, if if the battery is completely finished and it's not going to be used for wall storage or be some some people put them into a boat or they'll they'll retrofit another vehicle with them. They can take the cells all apart and rearrange them all. But if it's at the end of its life and 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 there just isn't any salvageable parts left in it, it goes to a various companies and there's several in canada and and they're all over the world now that can that literally melt the battery down and through some kind of electrolysis process um can draw all of the elements out of the battery everything but the plastic can be recycled and it all comes back as powder so you've got uh nickel you've got uh, cobalt you've got um, lithium you've got all the elements of the battery all end up in little piles and you and it's pure and you can then take all that product and um, and make a new battery out of it. You can do it over and over and over again for for forever. Um, so, and and we're they're trying to find ways to reduce the carbon footprint of that process because at the moment most of the manufacturing processes are are have a fairly high carbon footprint because of what they've got to do to to melt it all down and and and, and redo it. But there are some companies that are that are moving in a direction whereby they're going to be able to reduce that dramatically. I'm not an expert in that area, but I do read about it from time to time and, and it's very positive. Thank you. Am I able to make a comment? Yes. Yes, uh, well, on um, the 19th of September, I came in to Trans Canada Nissan on Lansdowne uh, Avenue and um, I asked for it before. And finally, I saw the new EV that uh, Nissan has, the Aria. Um, it is um, an SUV, um, average normal size, and I sat in it. Uh, I even asked the sales consultant uh, if he could give me uh, what would be the cost of purchasing that. And so he said the base price is a uh, fifty-four dollars to $56,000. And then you can buy more... Uh, uh, bits and pieces uh, 
and then the price goes up. But I think that's uh, a pretty fair price on a total EV from Nissan. Uh, that's all I can say right now. Good. Thanks, Trevor. I, I'm seeing Fiona's um, uh, um, question now. So do you want me to take that right now? Yes, please go ahead with that. Okay, so she's saying, I'm very interested in knowing more about EV charging in an older um, MERB um, based on the exi existing electrical system, et cetera. So, okay, so here's the thing. The, 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 the real quick answer on that is that um, there's a company called um, um, Switch Energy uh, out of Toronto that has um, invented a process. It's a software, um, uh, uh, from, I believe it's software, that you connect to your electrical system in your apartment building and what it does, it monitors the power that's being used in your building at any moment in time. And um, the the e, w if you have EVs wanting to be charged somewhere, you know, either in the building or just outside the building, um, the power that goes out to them is regulated based on how much power the building requires. So if your building is in a period of low power use, more power goes out to the EV chargers. If your building is maxed out in terms of, of, of its use, so let's say it's five o'clock and everybody's home, you know, cooking dinner, et cetera, then the amount of power available for the EVs drops down to zero or very low. And so you end up encouraging everyone to charge at off peak times because that's when you can get the power but it means that the building doesn't have to upgrade its electrical system. With the software, and it would be way, way, way cheaper than bringing in more electricity and doing all the things you need to do to, to change the building over. Um, you can convert your building, um, you, you can manage the power in your building such that the, the electric vehicles are sort of second in line to, to your building for its power supply. And that is gonna solve a lot of our problems for a while until half the building has electric vehicles, then we're gonna have a bit of a problem. But by that time, hopefully we'll have enough um, uh, initiative from the building owner to actually make the investment, uh, whether that they be a condo building or, or a rental building to make the investment uh, on their own to satisfy the needs of, 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 their, of their owners or, or renters. So that, that's generally how it works. And uh, it's been, they tested it for two years now in the US and Canada and it's worked. And I think they said 90% or 95% of all the buildings going back to buildings as old as 1950, they've been able to make it work. So that's my answer. Very good. Yes. And, and, and so did you say that there's, so there is a certain amount of uptake of, of that type of technology by some of these uh, uh, multi-unit places? You know, I don't know how many are, are know about it yet. I'm getting the word out, including to my own condo board in Florida, um, to see if we can move them a little bit, although I, I doubt it, but we're, we're gonna keep trying. But they just have to get the message out there. And uh, it's not widely known, but uh, I know about it because I got my antenna up and, uh, and saw the stories. Very good. Marilyn Freeman, you have a question. Yeah. Um... You're making me feel guilty, Robert. <laughs> I have a I have a one year old Toyota Sienna hybrid minivan, and it took a year to get that minivan. Um, and at the time, be, we needed a minivan, and there was no there were no options. So now I have this one year old minivan, which I am not about to sell very soon. Uh, but what I my question has to do with um, something that I've confused in my head. You you did say that Toyota was going, they're, they're concentrating on hydrogen. Uh, but I, I thought you also said they're looking at solid state. Uh, did you say that or did I imagine that you said no, that? I, I said both those things. And okay. and yes, they, yes, that's true. And that's why they're so far behind. Um, for a company that was a leader in electrified vehicles, they become the furthest behind or just about the furthest behind in fully electric vehicles. Um, you know, Toyota, Honda, they're the furthest behind of, of, of all of and, and Mitsubishi to some extent as well. But they're all Japanese companies because in Japan, they've rolled out hydrogen more than they have battery power to run their vehicles. It's a smaller country and much easier to set that network up. Um, so that's where they put all their money. They were shocked at how fast the interest in electric vehicles took off in Europe and North America. And 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 even even the Asia, the 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 you know Australia, New Zealand, all through that part of the world. So um, they've been literally caught 
and uh, admitted that they're a decade behind. So they're probably going to jump right over the current technology and try to come up with something earth shattering if they can pull it off. So we'll see. It's a bit of a gamble, but we'll see whether they can do it or not. So if I keep this thing for five to seven years, I might be good for the next one. <laughs> well, you know, Marilyn, I wouldn't wait that long. Um, uh, you know, event, before you know it, your, your gas vehicles are going to become less and less valuable because more and more people are going to be thinking electric. And so it, it, it could devalue faster than anything else that you could drive. And they're, you know, for the same price or pretty close to the same price of, let's say, a plug-in hybrid, you can buy most, you, you can buy a good fully electric vehicle right now with the rebates that are available. Um, they're within $5,000 of one another. And you're going to make it up in one year. So, you know. The question is the body style. I need the minivan. Well, Kia's got one already. You, you can go yeah. to your Kia dealer tomorrow and get the EV9. But it, it's already it's a it's a seven passenger SUV. One thing, Marilyn, uh, to to uh, reassure your guilt there is that you put more kilometers on your bicycle in a year than most people do on their car. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, Trevor has another question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yesterday, I um, uh, visited a friend uh, in Annismore. Um, and we talked about EVs, um, and he began to uh, question the aspect of, um, uh, like, um, an apartment building of uh, people who are charging uh, their EVs uh, probably overnight. But would this overload the circuit? Um, and um, he was he began to get rather concerned about the overload over the base load of um, uh, nuclear, et cetera, water, hydro. Uh, so uh, that's my question uh, for this evening. Sure, so, so Trevor, you have two questions there. Well, one of them I answered already to an extent, and that's can your building, can any building um, handle EV charging as well as everything else is going on in the building? And the answer is yes, it can with the right software. But the second question I think you're hinting at is, can the, our electrical grid in Ontario and in Canada support EVs? And the answer to that is yes, also. And it's just a matter of slowly ramping it up. And, you know, we, we think that electric vehicles use a lot of power. When, in fact, you know, it, it's a very small percentage of the overall power use in Ontario. And when we look at our own home and how much our electric vehicle increases our electricity bill in, in, in terms of kilowatt hours per year, it's it's probably similar to what our dryer and our range would use in, in a month. I haven't checked the kilowatt hour usage of those, but it wouldn't shock me if it's in that category. So really, you know, we can overthink this if we want to. And uh, if you have enough demand, we'll find supply. And it's just a matter of, of, of governments deciding that they, they need to move. And uh, I think we're going to see it happen. Good. Uh, Guy. Yeah, I, um, I I think this my question is actually a little bit related to, to, to Trevor's, which is, I'd like you to say, say a little more, if you could, Rob, about um, a V to G and where it actually is, not from a technology perspective, but from a legislative perspective, especially here in Ontario. Do you know of any rumors that it's actually going to be enabled at any time in the future? I, I wish I could say um, that, yeah, I've heard all kinds of of rumors no i haven't heard any um in fact if i was a, a betting person i would bet that our current provincial government would, it would be the last thing they'd think about um unless someone whispers in their ear that says oh by the way dougie um we we, we can we can reduce our our need for 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 gas uh, natural gas uh, generators if we just plug up plug in all our evs um, and encourage that process um, I'm not seeing that happening. Maybe it is, but but we're, we're, there's no evidence of it yet, and uh, and it hasn't been led. The governments have not legislated the automakers to make that move yet, but I think competition will. Um, you know, with with four or five car companies right now already having it, um, everyone else won't be far behind because it's being 
when you talk to someone who's got a Ford F-150 pickup right now, the first thing they brag about is, is the vehicle to grade capability. Um, it, even if it's only to, to, uh, to run their power tools and, and, and camp mount, um, you know, they, they understand it. And so that will become a big selling feature. Yeah, there was there was a pretty good article about it in the Star, in the Toronto Star on the weekend. We talked a lot about how this can be used, as you as you pointed in your in your presentation, to reduce yeah. the need for these so called peaker plants, which aren't really right. being used for peaks. Hmm. Yeah, Drew mentioned in the comments um, that uh, well, first of all, he was uh, um, thank you very much, but also he's greatly reassured that uh, that he made the right choice in a recent. Uh, VW purchase that he made, uh, all electric that he gets to pick up on Wednesday. Trevor, I'm going to jump over to, uh, to Al Slavin first, just because you've had a couple of questions already. So Al, go ahead. Just a comment. And uh, you can see where in you know five or six years, as there are more and more electric vehicles on the road, what it's going to mean is that the gas station operators are going to have a lot less traffic coming to them. And, I, and, and they're going to have to start closing. And I'm just wondering how long it will be into the future before we have the range anxiety is for where the gas next gas station is going to be, not where the next charger is going to be. And the thing is, with gas, it has to be trucked where it's going. With an EV charger, the, the, the lines are already in. So it's very straightforward to put in the charging system. Uh, I think the gas operators are going to have a really big issue in, on their hands in a very few years. So, so um, Al, I, I should just add to, to that. Um, I mentioned that there's a company in British Columbia um, that um, I think they're called Parkland, and they own half of the gas retail stations in all of Canada and a, at least a quarter of the ones in the U.S. And um, they uh, are already making the switch. They've started in greater in Vancouver, in the greater Vancouver area with uh, a couple of dozen stations where they're retrofitting them to first of all, be both gas and electric. Um, and as well, they're looking at some of them to be electric only, where they can't do a retrofit to have both because the footprint isn't big enough. They're considering whether they're gonna swap out some of the gas ones for all electric. Um, there, are car there are retailers like Wawa, which is in the Eastern part of, of North America and down into Florida, from Pennsylvania to Florida, they have made a deal with Tesla to um, put in electric vehicle charging in, I think, 6,000 of their locations. Um, we benefit from that in, in Florida near a condo where they put in eight uh, Tesla superchargers right there in the gas station. And um, there, some days, they can be as busy as one of the gas pumps will be. So um, they've already realized the huge economic benefit to them of ha having a gas, propane, and electric all in one location. So we're going to see this. I think the transmission is going to be that way first, and then eventually uh, we'll see the sw switch out. I know there's one gas station. Um, I can't remember which company it is now. Somewhere in Ontario that's already swapped out all of their gas um, um, tanks uh, for electric. Um, and they're, they're, they're kind of bragging about it, um, saying, see what we did. And I, I don't know where they are, but I did see a picture of it. And I don't think it was a makeup picture. Very good. Thank you. Um, I know we had a question that came in even before uh, before tonight's program started. Um, there was, um, I can't remember now, I didn't write the name down. There was someone that was asking, asking about the impact of mining for the various metals that are, are um, used in manufacturing batteries. Um, compared to the uh, energy or the environmental impacts used in um, retrieving the kind of the same energy's worth of fossil fuels. Um, so they're not talking about the life of the car. They're just talking about getting those minerals out of the ground versus getting fossil fuels out of the ground. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Sure, I, I can I can offer a little bit on that. That was it was it was Peter Hewitt that uh, that that put the question out, and uh, he couldn't be here with us tonight, so he he asked in advance. And you know, it, it's a question that that I've kicked around a lot too. And Guy and I have talked about it. And and whenever someone says to me, "Oh, well, you know, the environmental impact of the lithium-ion battery is so high that we couldn't possibly buy an electric car for 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 reasons that are personal," you know, I, you know then so I. You know, one of the things I, I asked them about is, well, what do you think the environmental impact is of the gasoline that you are putting in your vehicle? 
um, it has to be um, discovered. It has to be pulled out of the ground. It has to be refined. It has to be shipped to wherever it is you 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 get it, and then you put it in your vehicle, and um, you know three quarters of it is wasted energy, and the greenhouse gas emissions are going to be coming out of it forever in your vehicle. So let's look at the the, the total impact of producing the battery compared to the total impact of producing the fuel and operating the vehicle for even eight or 10 years, let alone 15 or 20. And I know people have been working on this. I, I, I haven't specifically researched it to find out what the numbers are, but the rule of thumb that I hear often is that the, the increased carbon footprint between just producing the battery and producing a, an elect, a, a gas powered vehicle, not the gasoline in it, but just the vehicle itself, is about one year's worth of driving a, a gas vehicle. So, and that's just the, the building of it, not the where's the fuel come from to operate it. So it's a very complex question, needs a lot of pieces have to be plugged into it. But the reality is it's not just one sided. You can't just look at one half of it. You gotta look at the other half because um, there is a huge carbon footprint associated with producing the, the, the fuel to run the vehicle, not to mention the burning of it, uh, and and the greenhouse gas emissions and the health related pollution coming from the the electricity. So um, it, it's I don't have all the answers, but it it is a certainly worth having a good look at. And I hope someone writes a paper on it soon if yeah. they haven't already. Great great answer. Kind of related to that, um, and getting back to where you were saying, ninety five percent of batteries are um, can be recycled. Um, you, you can't recycle the gasoline once you get no. that out of the ground. Um, no. and, and, but my question that kind of stems from that is, um, I had read uh, probably about two years ago <laughs> that uh, there were two plants in Canada, one in Scarborough, one in, I think, Montreal, that were already recycling batteries. Do you know anything about them? I think there's more like five or more now. But there's more than two for sure. I know one is in Quebec. I don't know where the other one is, but I know there's more than two. And um, the very first time I heard about this was was a, a German company that had kind of revolutionized the idea a few years ago. And next thing I know, all kinds of companies are popping up to get in the recycling business. Their biggest problem is they can't find enough batteries to recycle because they haven't worn out enough. They haven't got enough vehicles on the road yet, and the batteries are lasting longer than they thought. Um, and, and, you know, on that point, um, I just read a report um, in the past a few weeks about the fact that, that at least from the Tesla side of things, and I assume it, it would be the case for most other batteries that are made by similar companies, that the batteries are lasting longer than they thought they were going to. And that the, the, um, the degradation, the, the, the loss of range per year is lower than they thought it was going to be. Um, they were thinking it was going to be 1% per year, and now they think it could be a quarter of that, or at most a half of that. So, And we don't know yet, because there have, aren't enough vehicles out there that have been around for 10 years. In fact, there are very few that have been around for 10 years to know. But on the, the over the last few years, just looking at the vehicles they've tested, they found very little range loss over, and it doesn't matter whether you supercharge them, fast charge them, or, or charge them at home, it makes very little difference on the on the uh, damage to the battery. So that's very encouraging news. Um, not that we're worrying about it anyway, but but it's even better than, than we thought. So you know, 15 years might be 20 in terms of the life of the battery, which I think beats most gas engines uh, for their life. Yeah. Well, that's encouraging. And, and I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other, other day, and I can't remember what the what the context was, but he, he came up with this number. He says, no, like 90% of batteries are going to the landfill. And I thought, no, first of all, not, not, that information. No. And yeah, yeah. So so you, you, you looked at numbers and saw that they are mostly are going to the recycling plants. And if, being if, if they have value, if, if the recycling process has value, um, it will be done. It's all about follow the money. So at the moment, the, what's in batteries is extremely valuable. You know, you you know, ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars for a bat for a, for an auto battery, um, that's worth recycling. If yeah. you can if you can extract ninety five percent of it and use it again, 
and again and again. So yeah, it it, it it's going to happen. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that uh, that's a that is a a very excellent presentation that you've done for us, Robert. And there's a lot of great questions coming out of that. And uh, so I would just like to thank you. Uh, once again, for, for coming up and updating us. And uh, thank you for uh, everyone that came out to, uh, to, to uh, learn about this topic. And uh, I'm sure everybody's got some, uh, at least some wish to, to get into that market. I myself didn't jump all the way in, but I did get a plug-in hybrid. And it does a lovely job of getting me to Peterborough and back on electricity. So I don't have to put gas in it very often, except when I'm pulling my, my little trailer. And so it's... Uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, yeah. Rob. And I just like to end end with one one note that if anybody has any questions of me that they didn't get in tonight or thought about tomorrow, um, you know, that you can get a hold of me. Um, there are lots of people know my email address, and you can get a hold of me. Um, if you pick up my EV primer off of the the 4G website, it has my number and email address on it, so that you can you can reach out to me. So I don't. I, I, I love it when people connect with me. I have lots of people who do, and I'm happy to help. So, okay. thank you. And I hope to have that all on the uh, the webpage uh, by sometime tomorrow. So, okay, great. Okay. Thank you, everybody.